welcome to the Insight Myanmar podcast. Before we get into today's show, I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more written and video content on our website. If you haven't visited it yet, we invite you to take a look at www.insightmyanmar.org. In addition to complete information about all of our past podcasts, there's also a variety of blogs, books, and videos to check out. And you can sign up for our regular newsletter as well. But for now, enjoy what follows, and remember, sharing is caring. happy to be joined on this episode of Inside Myanmar Podcast with Rose Metro, who wrote the novel Have Fun in Burma, which we'll be talking about at length in this interview. So Rose, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us about your book. Glad to be here. Yeah, so let's get right into the book and uh, what you wrote, what it's about. Why don't you just start us off and tell us a bit, uh, give us a bit of the the summary of uh, what the book is about. Yeah, it's about a young woman who is um, kind of between high school and college and becomes interested in Burma and spends plans to spend a summer volunteering there in a monastery. Um, and it's set in 2012. She actually doesn't set out to volunteer in a monastery. She um, works with an organization that places volunteer English teachers, but she ends up in a monastery. Um, and so it's kind of set against the backdrop of um, the violence against Rohingya people and the violence in Rakhine State that was happening at that time and that was increasingly in the news in that time. Um, so I guess it's about um, kind of a coming of age story, um, but combined with a, a sort of passage to India like story of a young white woman going to a place that she does not understand very well. Yeah, right, certainly. And that lack of understanding is something that highlights much of the interaction and that we'll get into. But before that, uh, looking at you as a writer and your intentions and what you brought to it, what made you want to set out to write a book like this? Well, I so I've been studying Burma as an academic endeavor um, for a, more than 20 years. And I, so at that time, I had finished my dissertation, which was focused on um, the education of Burmese refugees in Thailand, particularly around the area of history and conflicting versions of history. And um, I was living in the U.S. Um, I had young children and I couldn't travel very much. So my usual trips to Thailand and Burma couldn't happen. And as I read the news about the crisis in Rakhine State and the violence, 
I wanted to engage with it in some way, but I didn't want to do it in an academic way necessarily because I felt like one, it it really was not my area of expertise and I had no on the ground knowledge of what was happening. Um, but also because I felt like the discourse had become very polarized and I wanted to write something that would invite readers to sort of take on multiple perspectives or to maybe understand an aspect of that conflict that um, hadn't been apparent to them earlier. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, I started writing it in 2014 before there was a ton of media attention to the topic. And so one motivation I had was just to let um, English speaking readers know that this was going on. Um, and it turns out the situation got so bad that I didn't really need to do that drawing of attention that much. So by the time the book came out in 2018, it was really in the news quite often. Um, but yeah, I guess I had um, kind of mixed motivations, both to s see what light I could shed on the topic from my very limited vantage point in the U.S., only reading news articles and talking to friends who were there and stuff. Um, yeah, and, and also kind of share that news with a wider audience. Right, yeah, and I think that wider perspective or just the perspective of the different actors is really what I think makes the book unique in that way in that it it's, uh, at least in my reading of it, it, it doesn't seem quite to give an answer for why things are happening or how to resolve it or who's right or who's wrong, but it really puts you in the perspective of, of the person speaking and of, um, of, of, of how they're conditioned, you could say, a psychological or a Buddhist understanding of what conditioning is, that they're, how they're conditioned to come to that understanding and hold those viewpoints that they do. And then you see those viewpoints constantly confronting and clashing with, uh, with others that as they come into contact. And I think as I personally, as I set out to read the book, I think there's always a bit of trepidation when you're coming to, to see some kind of art form, whether it's a book mm -hmm. or a, a, a movie or a, a TV series or whatever that is based on some, some subject matter that you're, you're very knowledgeable about just to see, just feeling how much are they going to get this right and how, how much is this going to be accurate to my lived experience. And it was funny because I was reading this book around the same time that this new HBO show uh, Tokyo Vice came out and I I was talking with one of my friends who had, we lived in Tokyo together for several years uh, some time ago. And he, I left uh, after a few years, but he's lived in Tokyo for, for 20 years now. And he was describing his own trepidation and, and watching Tokyo Vice for how well they're going to capture the live life in Tokyo and, and, and that being a, a really, really good, accurate depiction. And just having that conversation with him about his experience watching Tokyo Vice and living in Tokyo, I was thinking about this book and realizing, yeah, it was kind of the, the same feeling that I had in approaching this and, and just reading. I've read just about everything on Burma out there and movies and everything else and seeing the absolute, you know, far end of atrociousness of exotification of absolute mm -hmm. you know baseline understanding of nothing to things that that get uh, works that get some parts of it right and but there's some deeper level I feel like well they're, they're not quite getting this and so it, it's a very simple book it's it's not long and it's very it's the the language of prose is is uh is also uh, quite neat, but and yet it it puts the feeling of uh, from someone who's lived there for some time and interacted with many different aspects of it. I, I really have to say, there's an, and especially through the characters' voices more than anything else, it's those characters' voices that really bring out. Uh, a lived, a very authentic for me, lived experience of these different layers, and what I appreciated was that the the the, the confusion, the conflict, the lack of understanding, it's not explained, it's not resolved, and that's very authentic to my experience too, where I I have almost a sense of familiarity of how certain kinds of conversations and situations progress. And almost a familiarity to the point of expectation or anticipation, and yet 
no explanation, even after all this time, of why things are that way or how to make sense of it. And I've brought other foreigners into situations where I can completely explain what's happening and what will happen and even somewhat of the why it happens. But I can't really explain the the deeper meaning of like how I understand it. And I think that part really comes off. And so... Um, I'm wondering from from your hand, you know, so much about this is perspective, is is coming back to this issue of the different perspective of the different characters and how they're trying to communicate. And so why, as a writer, why was this so important to try to illustrate these competing and conflicting viewpoints and perspectives and to, to bring these different people together to try to converse and not really have it ending up in a, in a resolved way? Uh, wh- where was this intention coming from you and wanting to portray this? Yeah, well, thank you for that description and for appreciating the book and kind of seeing what I was trying to do with it. And I totally understand that trepidation of like, is this going to be horrible? I mean, there have been so many really not very good (laughs) um, works of art, literature, documentary film um, by people from outside Burma that Um, really have good intentions. I mean, I I think a big theme of the book is like good intentions, unskillful, Mm -hmm. bad Mm -hmm. effect. (laughs) Um, So I think, you know, and I really hesitated to write the book for that reason. So I, I am not a writer by trade. I'm an academic, I'm a university professor um, and just kind of like dabbled in writing over the years. Um, Hadn't published any, Thing that I had written in terms of like fiction or whatever. Um, but I was talking to a friend of mine who was a novelist and, you know, at the time I was kind of struggling through writing this like classic first novel about like my family. And, <laughs> and she was like, why don't you write something about Burma? You know, like she knew that I had knowledge in that area. And I was like, no, it's just so cliched. Like it's going to be horrible. Like I, I don't want to give an American audience what they want in a book about Burma. Um, and she paused and then she was like, write about that. And I think that that, that really inspired me to be like, okay, I can write about representation and how the people in the country are represented and frustrations I've had with that. And I can write about my own experience as a white American coming into that culture. And as you said, just not knowing what's going on. And, you know, I, so when I first went to the Thai Burma border, I lived in Chiang Mai for a year after I finished college. Um, So I was older than Adela at that time, but um, I was really struck by this lack of directness. I think even for an American, I'm a pretty direct, I've been told person. Um, I tend to just, I'm not conflict averse. Like I just, say what's on my mind. Um, And it did not work there. You know, I would be like, why are we moving apartments? (laughs) Why are we moving our office? Um, Mm. Or who's making the decision about this? And it was just like, not, um, I did not get the answers I was looking for. And I was so confused. And so I think, definitely part of what I wanted to capture in the book, you know, I made a strong decision from the start, not to write, not to try to write from the perspective of any Burmese characters, not because I think that like people like me can't or shouldn't do that because, um, but rather because I knew that I couldn't do it convincingly. Um, And I wanted the reader to be kind of stuck in Adela's experience and only be able to see what she saw and have to make sense of things in the way that she did. Um, And so, although I wanted to show different perspectives, the reader kind of has to like guess a little bit at why the other characters do what they do. You know, Adela is pretty forthright about her motivations and pretty um, 
you know, she, she reveals unflattering things about herself and, you know, wants people to think well of her and wants to be regarded highly, but doesn't always have actions that match with that motivation. And, um, that is a perspective I know well. So I always have to state very carefully. And there's a note in the back of the book, like this book is not at all autobiographical. Right. None of these things happened to me except doing a meditation retreat um, mm-hmm. in Burma. But yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of convey that sense of what it's like to, um, to try to work through human interactions in, in an unfamiliar setting. Mm, right. And so looking at these different characters, obviously uh, Adela is the one that the, the prism through which much of the story is told, even though it's not first person, but mm-hmm. there are these other characters that are there and it might be good to flesh them out a little and understand um, who they are, what their motivation is, how they're understood. Uh, for example, we have Sarah, we have Diha. Um, we have uh, some of the monks and there's one nun. I wonder if you can just run through some of the principal characters and let us know not just who they are in the book, because I think that's not quite as interesting as the archetypes they represent. Because I think for me in reading this, these archetypes just flew off the page. And so these, these characters that were described, they fit very clearly to me, just archetypes of people that, uh, that are quite familiar. So I wonder if you could run through, uh, some of these characters that you displayed here and just who they are in the book and then what they represent and, and perhaps people like that, that you've met. Yeah, sure. So I think you started with Sarah. Sarah is, um, the woman who, runs the volunteer organization that Adela is going through. And she's one of the first people she meets when she comes to Myanmar. And, um, you know, from the time I started going to the Thai Burma border in like 2001, um, there were always people who had like been there longer, knew more, um, and could function as these kind of gatekeepers, you know, of like, I'm more devoted to Burma than you are, or like, you don't know what you're doing. And it's, it's repeated in all these different contexts. So, you know, when I first went to the border, there were people who had been like at Manor Plaw, you know, like when Manor Plaw fell in the jungle, um, this kind of iconic moment in like the struggle between the KNU and the, Tamadaw like years ago um or later it was like when I went to um I went to Burma for the first time right after Cyclone Nargis and at that time you know there were people who there were just a few foreigners who had been living there you know before that happened it was pretty hard to kind of just like stay there um But I did have a couple of friends and contacts and I remember first coming there and having them kind of like sit me down and be like, listen, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't talk about politics. It's dangerous for people like you have to understand the situation. You're not in Chiang Mai anymore or whatever. Um, And I really needed that and appreciated that. Um, but there was also this, you know, and I think especially when I was a younger person, when I was in my early twenties, I I had this kind of resistance to it. Like, well, you think, you know, so much, like, who are you to be telling me what to do? Um, and so I, (laughs) I kind of, you know, I know a couple of specific people who the character of Sarah is based on, um, who kind of filled that role of like educating newly arrived foreigners um, on, you know, how things worked or how things worked according to them. Um, and I think, you know, it, initially Adela is kind of admires Sarah, but is jealous of her and, you know, doesn't really know how to relate to her, like wants to be friends, but Sarah is not interested in being her friend. She's like way cooler than Adela is. And so I wanted to kind of capture that. And I don't know if that 
makes sense like that character in terms of the archetypes you were describing oh, oh yeah oh yeah i mean as you're saying that i'm thinking of a couple of things one is i just i don't know if you've read burmese uh burmese lessons i think is the name by karen connelly yeah. about yeah, her yeah. love affair with a, uh, a burmese rebel but mm-hmm. so much of that that i mean that book is i don't know when it was published but i think it's written about like the 90s i think that's when yeah. it takes place yeah. And so much, one of the, the, the big themes of the book is like the, the authenticity and the proximity of the white uh, allies to, mm. the, to the movement and it, both in terms of how long they've spent, how many risks they've taken and right. who they're connected to. And she's very honest in, in her, her uh, romantic relationship with this rebel leader as like giving her greater authenticity. It's not why she's in the affair, but she also realizes that she's benefiting by being a more legitimate foreigner that's helping. So that came to mind. And then what also came to mind is certainly when I, I came to Myanmar in 07 to, to live, I was there 03 for the first time as a, as a meditator. And then 07 was when I started um, living and working. And I, I definitely felt on one hand, I felt a bit uh, like deferring to those people who'd been there before and wanting to learn from them and, and respecting their the time they spent. And then I remember that changing very quickly where after a year or two, when new people would come, I would, I didn't really feel like a, a sense of that I, I was, um, I was smarter than them or that I didn't want to, I didn't want to interact with them. It was more of a feeling of like, um, I don't want to have the same conversations I've had over and over and over. I, I kind of want to wait until they've they've been through the ropes long enough and then we can be peers. And I remember specifically one one time when two people came and joined my work and they were very nice people and they're friends today. But I remember at, at first just kind of like having the, the trying to impart my knowledge and what I'd learned and, and, and help in some way, but also having a bit of a distance because I just didn't want to have to deal with all those same conversations. And it's yeah. not even really the, 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 the answers to their questions that are challenging. It's that the questions are challenging. And so many of the questions, so many of the questions have to be unpacked. And, uh, and, and the questions themselves are what needs yeah. to be examined. And, and it's just a tiring process. And I remember after these two people had been there, I don't know what it was, six months or something, I just remember feeling like, oh, they've, they've this kind of thing clicked in on me. And they're like, oh, I, I can just kind of hang out with them. Like, we can yeah. just like shoot the shit. And like, we, you know, we have different levels of knowledge and different levels of experience and interaction, but I can learn from them. They can learn from me. And it's more of like this, this, um, this peer relationship where, whereas at the, the, the first couple months, it was a bit tiring. So yeah, those were things coming to mind as I heard your descriptions about Sarah. Yes, totally. Um, I think that describes that feeling really well. And I, I love Karen Connolly's work. Um, and I think, you know, if any book inspired me in some way, she wrote uh, a book a long, long time ago called Touch the Dragon. And it's about being an exchange student in Thailand in high school. And it's mm. excellent. Um mm-hmm. It's just so honest, you know, which I think she brings to Burmese lessons as well. It's like this kind of unashamed, like, listen, this is who I am (laughs) and um, this is what I experienced. And it's, it's a combination of kind of anthropological interest with um, emotional honesty that I really appreciate. Um, Mm -hmm. And let's see on to other characters. So, one character who is important in the book and who is based on a specific person, but someone I never spoke with, um, is Da Panchawati. Um, Mm. and so she's this nun who lives in the monastery where Adela is staying and she kind of becomes like a, a mother figure to Adela and watches over her and takes care of her, um, when she gets really sick, but also, kind of plays this role of like showing her by example what can't be explained in words. And so I did this meditation retreat in a monastery outside Yangon, the uh, Chamye Yeta Center. Um, And there was this nun there who, yeah, I never spoke to, but she, she just like showed me what to do. she showed me how to walk. 
She showed me how to eat. She showed me how to bow. And it, it wasn't like a didactic, you're doing the wrong thing kind of teaching. It was really gentle and it was really, really beautiful. And I just had this one moment where like she was walking really slowly in front of me and I was like, you know, who showed her how to walk that way? And then who showed that person how to walk that way? And I just had this feeling like it goes all the way back to the Buddha, you know, like there's this chain of teaching and experiential teaching and showing people how to do things um, that is this amazing lineage. And so although I never spoke to that particular person, she was kind of the inspiration for that figure in the book. And um, so I tried to imagine a bit of, you know, a, a person like that's life story and how they would come to be living in a monastery and, and taking this relationship to a foreign meditator. Yeah. And the thing that stands out with that relationship <clears throat> is that you get a sense of, of this nun's compassion and care and taking on the responsibility of overseeing and helping her as a sister or a daughter. And that's really beautiful. And yet there, there's something that's not, I, I don't know if it's quite spoken or addressed in the book, but it was a sense I had and also one that was familiar is there's like a further desire of emotional space or need or or uh, uh, a a deeper kind of friendship, and you you have the 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 kind of silly friendship that Adela has with her friend back in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But it's it's like this this greater emotional connection that she desires with the yeah. nun, given how she's helping. But it's it just doesn't materialize, and it's another one of those things where I mean we could have a whole podcast discussing uh, where why why and how that expectation, quote unquote, falls short. And I say, quote unquote, because this is subjective. This is from Adela's, and this is all, your book is all about perspectives. And from Adela's perspective, uh, there's this, at least I sense, this greater emotional connection she would like. And as, as close and tender as the nun is, that's just not something that develops uh, to, to the extent of what Adela might like. Yeah, that's it. that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I can I can see how you would. And I think what's been coolest about writing this book is just that readers kind of bring their own experiences to it. Um and especially a reader like you who knows so much of this setting. Um Yeah, I think honestly Adela doesn't realize <laughs> except in maybe one moment in the book that there's anything missing about that relationship you know like mm -hmm. um and I think she kind of takes it at face value or takes that person at face value because she's the nun is so nice to her um and she hasn't experienced that kind of compassion but you know maybe it has to do with the fact that like that nun would would do what she did for Adela for anyone and exactly yeah Adela is not she wants preferential treatment. She wants preferential yeah. love. She wants right. the kind of, um, you know, something that's personal and that's yeah. not what the nun is offering. Right. Right. You're special. You're meaningful to me. This relationship is valuable to me. And that's right. The nun is not, is, is not, uh, approaching that in that kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a couple of other characters in the book, there's Upinya, who's a monk, um, who's kind of, you know, greets Adela when she first arrives and is kind of nearest to her in terms of like um, their communication or their perspective. And, you know, that that character is not based on a specific person, but I, I did teach English in a monastery in Thailand actually um, was like a Shan Wat in Chiang Mai um, years and years ago. And it was, you know, it was something that I, I wasn't really comfortable doing. Like an organization I was working with was like, Hey, you should go teach English in this monastery. And I was like, is that really appropriate? Like, you know, and I was, I was so surprised by how frank and open the monks were 
um, and willing to talk about their experiences and their lives. And I, I didn't know, um, you know, it's hard to understand the boundaries in relationships like that. And Adela gets tripped up. Like she oversteps boundaries. She misreads signs, you know, and I, I did not teach in that monastery for very long, but I really feared doing that. Um, and so I guess, you know, that monk Upinya is based on kind of re- relationships that I had with those monks that I taught. Um, and then the the final important character is Thiha, who's this hmm. um, ex medical student, kind of couldn't finish medical school because he was imprisoned, and um, you know that's kind of the archetype of like the student protester, <laughs> and right. you know there's so many different generations, right? Like 88 generation or 96 generation or you know, now this new generation, but um, I wanted to kind of capture, I guess, a little more complexity about that archetype Um, because I think it was always kind of presented to me as a very simple thing. Like I am willing to die for my country. Like I will sacrifice whatever it takes. And there's, I mean, the, people definitely bring that to it. And there is so much bravery and, and um, so many inspiring qualities that people bring to that activist work, but they're also human, you know, and not, you know, enlightened people. And so they make mistakes and they do things for mixed reasons. And, um, and so I wanted to kind of humanize that archetype a little bit, I guess. Hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a good breakdown of who the characters are and we can get into some of the action and how they, how the plot progresses. But before that, one of the things I also wanted to call attention to is it within this book and within the reality of this book, there are two other books that are, are referenced quite consistently. One is probably not a surprise Burmese days by George Orwell. I mean, that is, that is any, any, uh, I think anyone writing any kind of document of any kind that refers in any way to white people coming to Myanmar, that, that is just the, 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 the foundation that everything springs from. So that's, um, um, that's not a surprising comparison to bring in or reference. Another one is Heart of Darkness, which is, uh, again, not uh, maybe not taking place in Burma, but also a, a very foundational novel piece of literature looking at the white experience in the uh, the non-white world, really. But I'm I'm wondering your choice of bringing these in, what, what you, this is what I'm thinking as a reader, as a writer making these decisions to want to reference these books and to not just reference them as, ex- as existing, but actually keep coming back to them and spending time and, and, um, having them be actually a part of your novel, what what comparisons did you see in what you were writing in these two books and how did they relate to the story unfolding? Yeah, I mean, I think the decision to make those two books so much a part of the novel is kind of like a nerdy academic <laughs> decision that I, um, you know, I wanted it to be intertextual and I wanted I wanted people to think about ways that they'd seen Burma or other colonized countries represented um, and, and to think therefore about like the tradition of literature um, about colonization um, and, and the relationship to current practices of, you know, international organizations and NGOs coming into countries and sort of often doing what they think is best for people without always consulting the people that they're supposedly helping and, and think about the parallels there. But yeah, I mean, Burmese Days is a wonderful book in that it captures that, like, just the instability of power, I would say you know, that Flory, the main character is like, he has all this status and power, but he, (laughs) he's so pathetic and like, you know, can't, can't get a handle on his desires and doesn't know what he wants and makes all these poor choices. And, um, not so different from Adela, we could say, 
Um, but also because so many of those books are written about men and from the perspective of men, you know, that I wanted to change that up a little bit. Um, and Heart of Darkness is in there mostly because it's like, what book would a high schooler have read that would have any relationship to what she was seeing? And, mm -hmm. and that was the one that kind of rang true. Um, but the, the book that's never mentioned in the novel, but that definitely influenced it most is um, E.M. Forster's Passage to India, which I read mm -hmm. when I was the first time I went to Thailand, I, I just like picked it up in a used bookshop. And, you know, the main character is also named Adela. And at one point she says, I want to see the real India. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of taken aback and I was like, how is this? Mm -hmm guy from a hundred years ago in my head. Like, how, does, how does he know what I want? Right. Um, I felt so seen in that moment. Um, mm. And I just kind of real, that was my moment of realizing like, I am not the first like young white woman to come right. to the East, <laughs> you know, to, to see what it's like and sort of dreaming of some kind of authenticity and dreaming that I'm different than everyone else who's done this before. Um, but yeah, I wanted to put my book in relationship to these other books, um, kind of for the reason you brought up at the beginning about like, just thinking about like traditions of representing places like Burma um, and how it's often done. Mm, right. And one of the things that I, I found curious in one of the passages in the email exchanges between Adela and her professor about Heart of Darkness is this idea of whether or not the narrator is reliable. And I was wondering if that was a wink to who Adela was. And I was wondering if this is something that readers of your book should also question about the reliability of Adela as a narrator. Yes, yes, exactly. So like, you know, we only have her perspective in the book. And I think how much people relate to her really depends on their positionality. You know, I've had, um, you know, a lot of American readers relate to her a lot and are like, yeah, she's just doing the things that make sense. And these other people around her are being really confusing. And, um, and then other people are kind of more critical of her and actually really annoyed by her. And that's more like the Sarah's <laughs> of the world. <laughs> you know, have right. seen yeah. a few Adela's in their day. Um, and it was kind of a fine line to make Adela like relatable enough, but not so annoying that you couldn't get through the book with her. And I, you know, in a first, in the first draft of the book, she was, um, she had finished college, not high school. And I had a couple of readers tell me like, mm, no, like I, I just can't accept this behavior from this person. Like it's, it's too hard to watch. And so I made her 18 mm -hmm. specifically so that she was on that borderline between right. like child and adult and, right. and maybe people would be willing to forgive her a little more, or at least like see her perspective. Um, but now I'm losing track of what your initial question was. Oh, it, it was uh, it was about the reliability of the narrator. Oh, yes. So, right. I mean, you only know what she tells you. And there are some points where she's clearly wrong. She learns later. So, you know, a reader could certainly, especially a Burmese reader, could get to the end of the book and be like, she didn't have any idea what was going on. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and I wanted the book to be able to be read in multiple ways in that sense that I really wanted to not conflate her perspective with truth in any way um, and make it clear that there were all kinds of limits on what she was able to perceive about her situation. Mm, right. And, and, so, and again, this comes back to so much of the book is about this perspective and uh, the conditions that form that perspective. Uh, that being said, there's also, one can also say there's, there's two primary worlds that are, are or, or two primary events or themes that are being portrayed in the book that are overlapping. One is the Rohingya crisis that starts to break um, in the, these pages. And then another is this um, Adela uh, coming to volunteer and, and this whole 
uh, mindset of travel and volunteerism and overseas experiences. And these are two extremely different things with really no intersection except for the fact that they're forced to confront each other because they're happening at the same time. So what were your thoughts in wanting to create these two different parallel tracks and themes, which then had no choice but to converge? Yeah. I mean, I think that's so often the way it happens. <laughs> like just that there are these situations in the world and, um, and you know, Americans always think they have the solution. The answer can fix everything. And so they will go anywhere and sort of insert themselves into any situation that's happening. Um, and I think, you know, that's, something that I didn't see clearly as a young person. Um, I didn't, the first time I left the U S I, I did this semester abroad in Beirut, Lebanon um, mm -hmm. in, in 1998. And I just, <laughs> I did not understand so many things about that society. And mm -hmm. I, so I got this idea me and these other American friends to like make this documentary about the Syrian military occupation of um, Lebanon and <laughs> this, this Lebanese professor who had trained at Harvard, we like brought this idea to her and we were like, we have this great idea. And she was just like, Oh my gosh, like <laughs> yeah. the door, sit down. You're not going to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, and then she said, why do Americans always think they can fix everything? <laughs> right. Yeah. I was like, you know, I was taken aback by that because I didn't even know that that was like a thing, you know, yeah, I was yeah, yeah. eight years old. Like I thought I was being really original. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're all conditioned, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I think I wanted to put that in the book of like, this is a super serious situation where people are losing their lives and they're losing yeah. their homes. Yeah. And to Adela, in a way, it's just something cool to put on her Facebook page that she's involved in and that she's close to. And, mm. um, you know, that's a, it might be a cynical way to read it. Um, and I think, you know, her motivations are mixed. She, she has the real intention to like reduce suffering and, and help people. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really know how to do it very well. And mm -hmm. that's something that it seems like happens all over the world. Mm, right. So staying on the Rohingya issue and looking at it from the other perspective, we talked mm -hmm. about the archetypes of the characters overall, kind of who they were and what they represented in the book. But there's another layer of archetypes, and this is kind of the archetype of the Bamar response and understanding mm -hmm. to what's mm -hmm. happening. And we have um, Panchawadi. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. um, is that the right word? Is that the right pronunciation? Well, like, Panchawadi. I had this long conversation with um, a friend who's like a language scholar, and he was like, "Listen, in Burmese, it would be like Pianzawadi, right. it would be Panchawati." So I just went with like the pronunciation I was more familiar with. So I say Panchawati. Right, right. Because often things are like written one, with one spelling yeah. and pronounced another way. And exactly. so then you have to, you know, like, yeah. So, um, so the nun, um, Thiha and Unyanika, a monk from Rakhine State. And these are, are kind of Bamar archetypal responses to the unfolding crisis, which is really interesting. So can you break down those three diverse perspectives of how they are understanding and seeing and expressing what's going on. Yeah. So Unyanika is a monk from Rakhine state and he is very convinced that like the Rohingya are the villains and that they're causing all the problems and that, um, you know, that, that kind of came from, an experience I had actually long ago, you know, in my early days in Thailand with a friend from Rakhine State who was really expressed some prejudices about Muslims that surprised me. Um, and this was right after 9-11. So I was I was living in Thailand at the time of 9-11. And it was so interesting to see that crisis kind of through other people's eyes. Um, but yeah, this one Rakhine friend I had was like, yep. 
not surprised at all. Um, and I was like, what are you talking about? And, you know, we're kind people are, are, have been oppressed by Bama people for so long. And, you know, I guess one reading is that they have then turned that oppression on um, religious minorities or ethnic minorities in their own situation. And um, so I wanted to have that just because that it surprised me so much at the time. And I was like, are you really saying that like all Muslims are evil? And he was like, oh yeah. Like I know that from personal experience. Um, and he was someone who was involved in the democracy movement, you know, like he was someone who shared a lot of political views with me. Um, <laughs> and so I wanted to put that in there. And then um, Da Panchawati, the nun is kind of more like, well, you know, Violence is not good. No one should hurt each other. And kind of doesn't really have much to say about it other than that. Um, doesn't have a, a political view. You know, feels like she doesn't understand politics. She doesn't understand. She's very humble and accepts the limitations of her knowledge um, and doesn't have the urge to have a position on it, which is frustrating for Adela. Um, and then Thiha is a more educated, you know, reads the newspaper all the time, is informed about the conflict, sees it in, you know, his, his mom is kind of this like pretty nationalist Buddhist um, perspective. And he's, he is critical of that, but also understands why she feels that way and, and probably has the most nuanced view of the situation, right? Um, but, you know, when the, when the conflict broke out and I talked to friends from Burma, friends who I had shared so many perspectives with in the past, I was, you know, I felt like we were both <laughs> kind of surprised by each other's perspectives, you know, um, and it felt awkward and uncomfortable and you know, I was kind of like, listen, it's pretty clear that like this violence is happening and that it's directed mostly toward these Muslim people. And some of my friends just didn't see it that way. You know, they were like, well, maybe that's happening to some people, but it's not as many as the newspaper says. Like there was a lot of resentment from my Bama friends from Myanmar about the nature of the news coverage. And I think that that it's, it should be criticized and can be criticized. It's like newspapers and journalists weren't interested in like the suffering of the Karen people, for instance, for the past, like however many years, and also not particularly interested in, um, you know, violence, all kinds of different violences existed in the country. And for whatever reason, the international media just really kind of latched onto like the Rohingya as the most oppressed group ever. Like, I think I literally saw that headline, like, <laughs> and I see that. I mean, I wouldn't, it's not like I would put forward some other group that I think is more oppressed, but I think that that kind of very one-sided coverage or yeah, was, was, um, frustrating to some friends of mine who just wanted a broader view of the situation in the country. Um, and so I wanted to kind of put those perspectives all in there. That That's really interesting. The <clears throat> commentary about, about Thiha and I, uh, and your relation with your friends, I had very similar where I, uh, as it was breaking, I was going to some of the friends I had that whose viewpoints I, I'd really come to trust and really and rely on. And when I remember seeing they would, people would sometimes say a Facebook post, like, Hey, I've been silent about this, but now I want to really give the, the real situation. I was like, Oh, finally, like <laughs> really get like a nuanced perspective. And then, and it was, it was anything but that. And it came to the point that I just realized I, I just couldn't talk about this with anyone. I, I did not want to go there because such a conversation could stain the whole relationship. And it was, um, it 
it was very, and as you said, this does have a right to be criticized. This does have a right to be mentioned. Uh, to me, uh, the only thing I can think of it bringing up was like, you know, Germany 1930s and like some mm-hmm. some Aryan German being like, oh, you, you, you know, like the, the way some of these people are thinking about Jews, it's just, you know, better just not to have those conversations, better to not let it get there because it's just starting mm-hmm. to stain so much. And it was really quite alarming to, to, to realize that I there was just a topic I, I didn't even want to broach with people because these uh, people that were otherwise overall very noble and very admirable in so many ways were expressing a viewpoint that I just couldn't understand. And, um, and not, not that, that I was trying to come with an agenda or had a point or knew, knew exactly the nuances of what happened, but it, there was just an absolutism of a, a, a cold detachedness of not wanting to care about people's welfare uh, uh, that was just cut off. And people that were so compassionate in a Buddhist meta sort of way, suddenly that compassion was not being extended for a whole group of people. And it was just, it was very confusing to me to know how to, how to engage. Uh, on the other hand, I appreciate the nuance that you express because I also felt that and I, I'm giving a, a the description I gave is, is more in the later years of as this, pro, pro, as this crisis progressed in the earlier years, I, as it started to break, I had another reaction and that, that was, um, my reaction was formed more out of my aversion to the way that Western press was covering it than what was actually happening. And my aversion to how it was being portrayed and covered was so great that it actually prevented me from taking the steps to want to learn what happened because I just felt the level of ignorance and sensationalism was through the roof and was, was so inappropriate. And, you know, there, there was just so much missing from just the, the way that it was being portrayed, as you mentioned, you know, like with um, the suffering of some of the other ethnic minorities and many other ways. And I couldn't break through to actually learn about it in those early years because I, I just was seeing like Western media latch on as this, this, this new great thing that they wanted to cover. And so at first I was kind of sympathetic to the, the more reaction to this, but then as it progressed and, and the, 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 the trenches just got, people got a bit tighter in where they were standing and a bit more um, obstinate and wanting to understand anything else, then this breakdown occurred. But what's really interesting to me is that um, when I think back, the, the, the first, the, the real watershed moment for me, and not just for me, but I think for many, many people, most books I read about the Rohingya reference this point. It was the Time magazine cover of yeah. Riratu that said the face of uh, Burmese terror and, or the, I think the face of Buddhist terror is what it said. Right. And I remember the exact place I was standing when I saw that, the Chiang Mai train station. And I stood paralyzed because I had been coming out at that point, I'd been coming out of years of experience living in remote monasteries where I was the only non-Burmese there and having respect towards the, the lay monastic relationship and just the not knowing anything really about the crisis at that point, but just seeing that cover, it just, it, it brought back images of colonialism, of, um, you know, lay, uh, white lay um, critics that were were going after a monastic in, in ways that were more suited to a Western journalistic, um, perhaps even sensational context and not so much on... Um, on uh, uh, not not understanding this at a deeper level, and it just these it, it brought up all this, and it, it it really drove a wedge. I mean, it drove a wedge in me seeing that cover, and I think it drove a wedge in a lot of people on one side or the other to see a cover like that. What's so interesting is that that article was written by Hannah Beach, who uh, is currently the um, bureau chief of the New York Times in Southeast Asia and is primarily responsible for covering Myanmar. I spoke to her last year uh, about a number of things and that that article came up and I, I was a bit um, delicate in how I was talking about, you know, my feelings towards um, um, just how, uh, how impactful that was. I was kind of broaching it in a delicate way. She told me that she did not want that cover. That was not her choice and she protested against it. And that the article, in fact, that she wrote was quite different in its approach than what the cover indicated. 
And all of a sudden I reflected and I realized I never read the article. I, I, I'm basing everything on how powerful that cover was. I mean, that has got to be, in this age of internet journalism, that has got to be one of the most impactful magazine covers of anything in the last 10 years or whatever it was. I mean, so many people go back and reference that. And it's incredible to me to realize that the the author of the article herself was was not in favor of that cover and felt it was in contrast to the article and yet it's one of those things where like the nuance gets lost and everyone just comes back to what that cover means to them yeah yeah and i mean just my limited experience doing journalistic work is like yeah you never get to write the headline um you know, the, the publisher chooses the way they're going to present your work and what kind of tagline they're going to put on it. And I can understand why that was, it's frustrating. And it's like, well, you want to get your work out there, but are you willing to do it, you know, when it's going to basically be this like clickbait type thing? And yeah, that cover made a big impression on me as well. And actually, I, I wrote about it in the last part of the book, but I think I, pretty sure I cut that out at some point because it was just like too long and complicated. And um, I didn't want to get into all that explanation, but yeah, it really made an impression. And I mean, I don't know if you probably read a lot of Hannah Beach's other work, but she read, she wrote this amazing article in the New York times about what to do when you realize that the people you're interviewing are not telling the truth. So she mm-hmm. describes like going to this camp and this Rohingya woman is like telling her this story of, you know, her baby was killed or something terrible happened. And so they, they try to like fact check it and realize at least according to them that like it couldn't possibly have happened. And mm-hmm she writes about like, well, what do you do as a journalist? Like this stuff definitely happened to other people. Mm -hmm. It just didn't happen to this particular person. And this person has seen so much and been so traumatized. Like who knows why they were telling that story. They thought they would get some kind of compensation or they just saw that happen to someone else and they wanted Mm -hmm. to get or someone told them to say that. It's like that old trap of like, being in Adela's mind and not being able to figure out why the people around you are doing what they do. And Mm -hmm. anyway, she just wrote about it in a really nuanced way. I thought um, about the dilemmas of covering that kind of disaster, which involves so much human suffering, but also there's so much that's not knowable, um, including people's motivations. And you kind of have to decide how to present it. And I try to put this into the book a little bit in, in the fact that like Adela has this blog that she's writing that she's her, her high school teacher was like, listen, if you're going to leave school early before graduation, you have to like write this blog that we're all going to read at this like kind of elite private prep school she goes to. And so you see her (laughs) like trying to put her experience into words and trying to be authoritative, but not really knowing what she's talking about and making generalizations. And, you know, people work their whole lives to sort of be good journalists and figure out what the ethical thing to do is. And then other people can just like write some version in a blog and there's no Mm -hmm. accountability or they can write a Facebook post or they can write whatever they want. And it can be really misleading and limited. Um, but but also hard to unpack. Right, right. You have an excerpt in your book on these different understandings and perspectives and and, when, and the conflict between them about the Rohingya crisis as that develops in a conversation. Can you read that excerpt? So this is a scene where Adela has this article um, from the New York Times about the crisis and she has brought it in for the monks to read in her English class. Um, And so you'll hear about some of the monks and their reactions. Usila came first. He picked up the article and read the headline. Very terrible, he said. Yes, very bad, Adela agreed. You know these things from your own country, he said. Yeah, she said, a little surprised he'd made the same connection she had. Since 9-11, it's gotten a lot worse. He shook his head sadly. The others came in as a group, neat and dry under their special orange monk umbrellas. 
Upinya nodded vigorously when he saw the article. Yes, we must discuss this one, he said. Sayama Sabi must understand our country. Yeah, I have to say, I don't really understand. Adela was relieved. But maybe we can do something about it, like something to help. Yes, we can do, said Uaga, smiling. Why not? Yeah, like maybe some kind of fundraiser or public statement, just to let people know that this is not okay. All the monks nodded, and Adela felt herself getting excited. She could actually do something. I should speak about one matter, said Unyanika. I am Rakhine people from Rakhine State. Our Rakhine people are Buddhist for thousands of years. Our kingdom, Mrao And he went on for some time about an ancient kingdom with a famous Buddha statue that had been stolen by a Burman king. Adela didn't see what it had to do with Muslims, but she had learned that Unyanika didn't like to be interrupted, so she waited for the other monks to intervene. Like I say, Usila finally jumped in. You have the same problem in your country. Muslims come and bomb your towers. Well, that was different, Adela said slowly. Wait a minute, so you're saying that this conflict is the Muslims' fault? Maybe when she and Usila had said that the situation was very terrible, they hadn't agreed on why. Yes, of course their fault. They do this riot and raping? Adela looked around the room in utter disbelief. The other monks nodded, confirming Usila's charge. Upinya, seeing his teacher frowning, piped up. Sayama, of course you know about our national races. He and Adela had discussed the Civil War previously, when he'd seen her reading Insurgency and the Politics of Ethnicity. He said he felt sympathy for all the ethnic peoples and wanted peace. He supported Aung San Suu Kyi and his older brother had participated in the same 1988 demonstrations that Ko U had. In my opinion, Upinya began gently, these people are not Myanmar people, not our national races. They come from Bangladesh, only recently. These people? But there are Muslims all over Burma, right? Adela asked. Her heart was beating faster. She had that feeling again, of being in over her head, of being dropped into cold water. They can't all have come from Bangladesh. Maybe some, Upinya admitted. The other monks looked down at the article with knitted brows. Perhaps they didn't understand the English, Adela told herself. Maybe she wasn't communicating clearly enough. She tried again. Say they did come from Bangladesh. Don't they have human rights just like everyone else? I think we must protect our culture, said Unyanika haughtily. But what does it have to do with culture, she asked. People can be from different religions and still have the same culture. Like in American culture, there are people from many religions, many races. I mean, they're African Americans and... Your country is very different to ours, interrupted Unyanika. Then you cannot understand our Myanmar people. I have read about this problem in your country also, said Usila. Some people come in by secret from Mexico with no passport, make many babies. But they're not Muslim, and anyway, there's nothing wrong with Mexicans. I love Mexicans, Adela insisted desperately, glad that no Americans were there to hear how silly she sounded. Usila shook his head in bewilderment. Not all Muslim are bad. Only about 99%, said Unyanika with great seriousness, as if he were quoting a well-known statistic. Did you know 100% of the rapes in Myanmar are done by Kala? Adela couldn't believe what she was hearing. Kip had said that Kala was like the N-word. How could a monk use it? In Myanmar, we are Buddhist for a long time, said Unyanika. But now some are changing. Some Muslim marry Myanmar women so their children will be Muslim. The mosques give them money for taking Myanmar wife. I know this from my own experience in my hometown. Adela found Unyanika's theory so bizarre that she didn't know how to respond. She tried a different tactic. But the whole country isn't Buddhist. There are Christians here too, right? Okay, fine. Christian is no problem in Rakhine State, said Unyanika. Very small number. And, he said, stabbing at the article, this is not correct. So-called Rohingya are not minority. They grow and grow. It is we Rakhine who are a minority now, minority in our own state. Many years ago, these Muslim people have an army. They try to separate and take over. His voice was louder now, and he leaned across the table toward Adela. Upinya patted the air between them. Sayama, I know it sounds strange for you. You came here just some weeks ago, but we faced this problem a long time, no? They're not a problem, they're people, she gasped. Zabe has any Muslim friends? Unyanika demanded. Well, she searched her memory. There was that freshman in her phys ed class. Yes, yes, I do, and all my Muslim friends are very nice, very kind. 
Unyanika practically shuddered with disgust. Then Uaga jumped in, smiling as he exclaimed that Muslims only went to stores owned by other Muslims. Adela was shocked. She had never encountered such blatantly prejudiced statements. Edgerton Fields had a strict code of conduct related to hate speech, and even the most subtle comments could leave one open to accusations of racism or sexism. By comparison, she found the monks' views of Muslims almost laughably straightforward. She felt like she had entered another place in time, like she was Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird, standing up against injustice. But it was so confusing. She didn't want to argue with the monks. She wanted to go back to the place in the conversation where she thought that they agreed about how to fix the situation in Rakhine State. Only Usuria, the oldest monk, had stayed quiet. Adela had thought of him as the least friendly, but now she appealed to him for help. Usuria, what do you think? His deep-set eyes were so dark Adela couldn't see his pupils. Monks should not involve in politics, he said. That silenced the others. They didn't read the article that day. The rain-spattered copies still lay on the table at the end of class. Adela threw them in the garbage. Yeah, that's that, that's an incredible passage. I mean, that, uh, that that that's just an amazing job of bringing these different viewpoints into contrast with each other. And from the very start of that conversation, I I, I got where it was going. I, I just thought it was so brilliant the the beginning of that that they're both agreeing it's terrible, and the 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 irony, even the humor of finding out why they think it's terrible, and then the conversation progressing as you just see Adela trying so hard to use her tools and understanding of logic to be able to navigate through an understanding while also a promotion of her progressive views and, uh, and the confusion in doing so. And it, um, like a couple thoughts as I'm, as I'm, as I read it and as I'm hearing it now, uh, one thought is that I was thinking about this scene in particular, uh, the book in general, but especially this scene as a contrast between an academic paper or a journalistic article and a novel. And I, I realized that there was something about, well, the book in general, but especially this scene, which seems to impart some kind of knowledge or understanding of the situation without in any way trying to present how to resolve it or um, uh, re really it's just kind of examining the problem more than trying to figure out what to possibly do about it and how to bring these viewpoints together. It doesn't even attempt to do that. If anything, it tries. To, it seems to show that uh, the, the, the difficulty and even the fallacy in that. But there's something in a, a, a novel, a literary work that is able to illuminate and bring out the reality of this, um, uh, of not just the crisis, but of the way the crisis is held and seen in a way that a, a head on factual take of an article or a book or something couldn't do quite to this effect. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what you thought as you were writing this and having, being able to take that literary angle, what it allowed you to do in trying to bring life and description to the, the scene and context uh, and even the facts around it that going more head on in academia or journalism might not be able to. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I've done a lot of academic writing about Burma and it's, you know, it has its purpose and I think it's valuable, but it also is just very limited and, and, you know, it gets tiresome to like defend an argument, you know, and at some point you're just like, do I even really believe this anymore? Like, you know, like why do we have to argue for a specific interpretation or a specific perspective? <clears throat> and so I really wanted to just be able to, instead of saying like, this is what's wrong or what's right, just like, these are some things that people say. And I wanted, you know, it's, it's interesting to try to strive for believability rather than to strive for accuracy. You know, like someone really said to me that thing about 99% of Muslims being bad. Um, and you know, so I know that it's something that someone said, and obviously you wouldn't put that in an academic paper because it's ridiculous. Um, but not understanding that people say that is missing a big piece of like why things are happening the way they're happening. And so I wanted to, um, 
I guess it's kind of get away from the attachment to views that comes with academic writing, you know, and like defending a position and then having people attack your position and trying to prove it wrong. Like it's just a very, um, it can be, it can feel kind of, um, what's the word conflictual or aggressive or something. And I wanted to have something that it's like, you can't disagree with a novel. Like you can think it's a poorly written novel, which, you know, people could certainly say, you know, and I think one, one criticism I've gotten, especially from people who don't know much about Burma is like, is kind of didactic. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not the most subtle, I think at like, I mean, it's like George Orwell also wasn't an awesome novelist, like I, a lot of people say, like he and not to compare myself to George Orwell, but like in terms of the import of my work. But like, you know, you don't have to be an amazing like wordsmith to sort of convey different perspectives that people have on people and and to to make the reader feel something. And so I think that contrast between okay, so academic writing tries to make the reader think something and non-academic writing would be like trying to make the reader feel something and not a specific thing necessarily, right? Just like make them feel what they feel in reaction to these different perspectives. Mm, Right. The second thing that I thought in that scene in particular, but also is indicative of the book in general, is... um, just this question that was in my mind is like, could this have played out any differently? Is is there, um, and, and and when you look at the how the book progresses, it won't give away the ending, but uh, Adela continues to make a series of well-intentioned decisions that don't exactly go how she intended. And so in some way, these are specific moments that if she hadn't have made these choices uh, overall, the disaster that unfolded wouldn't have come. But it doesn't feel to me like one of those accidents where you just go left instead of right. And if you just would have done the other thing, it might have turned out differently. It, it feels more like, an, it, frankly, like an inevitability, just that the way these conditions and perspectives are set up, I don't really know what range of choices are or or broad options and flexible styles of communication understanding are possible that if you don't make this disastrous choice here, you make this series of not very wise decisions or this bits of non-engagement, which doesn't do anything or et cetera, et cetera. But in, in, in reading this specific scene, it, it definitely comes out here. And it's a, I think a feature of the whole book is this question of, are, are these, are these just a series of poor decisions, which could have been differently or is Adela a, a, a kind of um, imperfect or um, a flawed character that is just incapable of of being able to engage differently, or is this such something much much greater? Where, however many times you played this and however many choices you took, it's really hard to see how a different outcome would could possibly happen. Yeah, I mean, I guess as you're talking, I'm thinking about the concept of dependent origination, which I would not be able to give a coherent explanation of, but just like the idea that there's a complex relationship between cause and effect. It's not a deterministic relationship, but it is operating on some principles, right? And that Adela, you know, she didn't have the skill to get through that conversation in a different way. She reached the limits of her conditioning and her knowledge. And like, um, not that it couldn't have gone differently if she had been making other choices all along, but like a lot of things would have had to be different, you know? And I think like, we're always looking for that moment when we can kind of start over or start fresh without this baggage of our past karma and that moment does not come, right? It's like we're, we can only ever operate from the karmic situation that we're in, which has to, de- you know, dependent on all our different past actions. And yeah, I mean, I guess I would be interested 
you probably know more about the kind of philosophical aspect than I do, but like, do you think she could have done something different? Uh, yeah. So there's two different tracks of looking at it. There's the dependent origination uh, context of Buddhism. And then there's just the different cultural conditioning of the different societies. And um, I, I couldn't, you know, and I, I could place myself in that moment of, or, or not in that specific moment, but in that context where I've been and it's really hard. And, and actually what brings to mind now is, uh, I remember uh, at one point, uh, a very good friend of mine, a Dutch monk, um, came and stayed with me in uh, Yangon for a few days. And we went to, we, while he was there, our neighbor was offering him food and we ended up getting into a conversation with my neighbor. And my neighbor went on to talk about uh, a very serious Buddhist and meditator. And he went on, he had just had some sitting and he came to our house ref refreshed and energetic and talking about this insight he had about the, 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 the dissolution of any self and how man or woman or Burmese or American or animal or human, that these were all just kind of false distinctions and his experiential understanding in this recent sitting and how excited he was for this. And I kind of looked at my Dutch monk friend, a little, little twinkle in my eye and just I might have said something or I don't, I don't remember, but I said, you know, I think this is an opportunity. I think this is a door right now into being able to have a kind of conversation that we just can't have usually. And not, not that my, my neighbor was, um, was, was anything different than, uh, than, uh, stood out in any way to, to other Bamar friends we had, but just that both my friend and I had had difficulties in being able to carry on this type of conversation. And so my friend and I, um, went, started to, uh, converse more about his insight and lead him on about the, the, how these distinct distinctions disappear. And then we got to the end of it and we said, well, how about a Rohingya and a Bamar Buddhist? Are there, does, does this also hold up? And immediately you saw this kind of discomfort come to him mm -hmm. because it was suddenly bringing a practical reality into his meditative insight. Well, my neighbor is a remarkable, remarkable person. I've spoken about him elsewhere and just, just someone I just have enormous admiration for. And he held that, you know, and, and he, you could see the discomfort as he was working through it, but you know, to his credit, which is what I expected, he was able to come out the other end and say, no, you're, 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 you're right. I mean, there can't be, how can there not be a distinction between man and dog and, you know, uh, human and ghost. Um, and yet I'm going to say there's a distinction between these Rohingya that are doing all this to us and the Bamar Buddhists. And, uh, and so we were able to get there, but I, I bring up that story because that to me was a very unique moment where I felt there was actually a, a doorway through skillful communication to be able to, in some manner, in this way, it was through meditative insights that we were able to proceed to be able to break through what, what wasn't possible before. But that was like living in Myanmar day after day for years and basically throwing this topic away because I couldn't find a way to make any headway in it. And this is just one moment that appeared where it was possible. And so I, I would take the more pessimistic view that it, it seemed to me, the book and that scene particularly seems to paint a picture uh, more of impossibility of anything working than just a, a flawed character or flawed decisions. Yeah. And I mean, I think that story, thank you for telling that story. It really illustrates like that Buddhism is both or what people think of Buddhism is this kind of driver of the conflict, right? It's like in some sense, a religiously motivated conflict, but Buddhist teachings also offer the way out of that conflict. And so it's this weird paradox where it's like, well, maybe if people meditated more or if they like spend more time focusing on Buddhist practice, then this religious conflict would kind of dissipate in a way as people gained this wisdom that I think you're talking about. But it's, um, I think it's hard to, it's hard for me to sort of explore that possibility in a way that doesn't feel kind of um, patronizing, I guess, like, oh, you know, like yet again, this like white colonial figure being like, you don't even understand the teachings of your own Buddha who you're, you know, fighting for. Like, that's not right. what I'm saying at yeah. all. Um, mm -hmm. But I think 
you know, the story you just told shows that there is, there's, you know, the Buddhist teachings lead away from violence and conflict. So, yeah. Right. And that segues into um, the last big theme I wanted to discuss, which is this concept of exoticism. And the exoticism can take perhaps two forms that we can discuss. One is the exoticism of Heart of Darkness style, um, of uh, uh, the Orientalists, for sure, of um, scholars, uh, colonial administrators, tourists, travelers who are coming from the white world into other countries. And wanting to to find an exotified scene that can can fit their expectations of what the orient is if you if you want to tie it specifically to to asia and to southeast asia uh there's another layer of exoticism and that's of the meditation and the buddhism and the orientalists have certainly latched on since the 19th century in their understanding of burmese buddhism what what they want it to be what it should be where where it's not meeting certain marks of what they think it should be achieving and this kind of orientalist view when i when i first started to read about the orientalists and not just the orientalists of like edward said of how i was first introduced in his um the egyptian scholars uh, introduction of uh in his examination but when i was looking really more specifically at some of the orientalists of the 19th century and mid 20th century and how they would um, whether they were practitioners or or monastics or whether they were scholars or colonial administrators I was really stunned how much these Orientalist views were still present in in the present day uh, among meditators I saw coming over. Things that were still were, were definitely very strong in me at first, and that through my time in Burma I started to unpack and and dissipate the traces of and uh, and to examine. But when I would see foreign meditators, Western meditators coming to Burma, however noble their spiritual path and however noble their intentions how much they were missing about everything that was in front of them because they were so just so clouded by orientalist visions which you know were really like if you were just to to read and examine how these took shape 150 years ago a very little difference to how it was being healed today and so there's been this desire to exotify Myanmar the monkhood specifically and uh, as as meditators come today on pilgrimage or meditation courses, that that's still something that 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 you see present there. Adila is not a a meditator who comes to Burma for the purpose of achieving a spiritual path. She's a uh, she seems to fit more in the mold of a progressive do gooder American that wants to travel to a foreign place, wants some wants to genuinely help, but also. Uh, wants to to get some credibility for uh, from her friends back home for her proximity to um, to something more authentic. Uh, you can go into all the details of her cocktail of uh, intentions and, and mm -hmm. motivations driving her, but she's not she's not a, a meditator that is that is coming that is is steeped in the right. practice and coming to um, uh, to Burma for this express purpose. But yet this this does come to be something that she's involved in the the act of meditation as well as living in a monastery and so to what degree were you conscious of this narrative both in its present day occurrence as well as in the the historical orientalist writings and perspective uh, to what degree were you conscious of this while writing the book and how did it inform your decisions yeah that's an interesting question i mean i think when i first started going to southeast asia um in my early 20s, I also, I was not particularly interested in Buddhism or meditation. And a lot of my friends, Thai and Burmese friends would like take me to the temple and kind of like, want me to be interested and encourage me to do a meditation retreat. And I was always, I resisted it, I think, because of kind of what you described of like, well, it's just so cliched like the white person goes to the east and becomes interested in buddhism like i didn't want to be this like i don't know stereotype but i mean eventually it worked <laughs> right so like i i did become interested in it um and i think i you know when i started to meditate and when i started to do retreats and realize just even get a taste 
of what that was about. Like it's such a long path. And, and yet for me, the start of it was like very dramatic and exciting. You know what I mean? Like the first retreat I did, I was like, this is amazing. Like, you know, has anyone heard about this? You know, and, and Mm. I just had, I felt so excited to quote, discover it. Right. Like, um, but I, I also kind of like, it was hard to describe to friends and family. It was hard to, um, it was hard to present what I had experienced. I think because of partly because of what you're describing of like, oh yeah, Rose went to Thailand and did some meditation retreat. And now like she doesn't drink alcohol anymore. And like it, it just sounds so cliched. Like, and I think I, um, I guess I, in writing the novel, I mean, I wanted to show what the beginning of that path can look like. And also being just a tiny bit further than Adela on that path that like, that beginning is also very limited, but it, it doesn't feel limited, you know, like it feels amazing. And so it's like, wow, I've discovered this super cool thing that, that I just want to share with everybody. Um, and so I think it's, you know, when I think about people coming to Southeast Asia and like seeking to learn and seeking to study, they come from all kinds of places. And, you know, they can come from a place of humility or a place of certainty. And you can't really know or judge like where other people are coming from, really. Um, But I mean, I guess this is one way to say it. Like, I wouldn't want someone to read. There's one way to read this novel, which is like, don't go to other places. <laughs> you're not going to know what's going on and you're just going to make a big mess, right? Like it's not that pessimistic of a book. Um I guess it's kind of more intended to be like a temper on American optimism, um both spiritually and politically because I think there's a parallel, right? It's like Americans want to fix everything. Yeah, we also want to like reach enlightenment in like two days, you know, go sit in a cave somewhere and be <laughs> like, I shall emerge enlightened. Um, mm. And so I think that that conquering mentality, there's a carryover, right? And I think that's the parallel with colonization. Like this knowledge is mine. Like I'm going to get this knowledge and I'm going to use it to do whatever I want with. Mm, right. And in another world, I mean, this kind of, there, there's elements of this story that can bring out the, the more, um, how to say, the more beneficial or inspirational story of like classic Burmese Buddhist, Burmese Buddhist meditation, Burmese Buddhist monastery meets Western mindfulness and Vipassana meets uh, foreign yogi that comes to participate. You, there's there's side characters here of a Swedish and Taiwanese yogi, and there's a description that we'll get to in a moment of Adela's own meditative experience. And so there's there's elements of this story that could be brought out and told in a different way that come to talk about a a Westerner leaving behind a, a kind of materialistic and confused society to have a more simple, um, introspective, uh, mindful life and to, 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 to see the, the value in that meditative experience, that meditative experiential, um, a moment of, of living in, in a monastery and learning these techniques, which can be a life-changing experience and is for so many people. And I, I know it is for you. It was for me. It's wouldn't be doing this podcast here. I've spent the time in Myanmar if I hadn't have gone through such a powerful transformation. And so there is that part of the story that's kind of embedded in at the edges of what is more really centered on the plot. And maybe I'll just read this short part where she first sees the Taiwanese meditator meditator and doesn't know what's going on. And then if you want to include Mm -hmm. that, you can, but you don't have to. Sure. So this is her first encounter with the lady meditator from Taiwan. When Adela woke from her nap, it was nearly five and she leapt out of bed, terrified that she might miss tea time. 
As she was rushing out of her room, she stopped. A woman in a long brown skirt and white blouse was coming out of the room across from hers. There was nothing remarkable about this woman's short black hair or stocky figure, yet she appeared to be moving in slow motion, like a mime. She pulled the door shut so slowly that her progress was almost undetectable. Without pausing, but at the same speed, she turned and began walking, if one could call it that, toward the exit, staring at the floor in front of her and placing her feet so softly that she seemed to be avoiding invisible landmines. Adela deduced that it must be the lady meditator from Taiwan that Upinya had mentioned. She didn't look like she was meditating. She looked like a zombie. Nonetheless, Adela decided to introduce herself. Hi, I'm, she began. And then she stared in amazement as the woman's head turned mechanically toward her and then her eyes turned within her head millimeter by millimeter to regard Adela. The lady meditator met Adela's eyes for a moment, nodded almost imperceptibly, and then began inching her head back in the opposite direction. As Ella stood there stunned, the woman continued toward the door. Okay, she couldn't help saying out loud. So that was sort of Adela's first encounter with like a meditator, someone, you know, who's doing these practices, who's not a monk. And then I will read a couple of pages um, of Adela's own experience. So she's doing this, like supposed to do a 10 day retreat or whatever. <clears throat> um, it's maybe like six days in, it hasn't been going super great. Like she's been really distracted. She's having a lot of pain in her body. And then this first part that I'm going to read is actually from her blog. She's trying to describe um, to her audience back home, like what the meditation retreat was like. So she says, the sitting meditation before breakfast was always the hardest for me. I was sleepiest and hungriest then, and I had come to dread it. But that morning, the morning of the sixth day, something happened to me. It was like sitting in the darkness of the eye doctor's office, straining to read the blurry letters when suddenly the correct prescription was flipped into place. Except my eyes were still closed. My whole body relaxed, but the sensation of my breath coming in and out became crisp and distinct, occurring at the exact moment that I noted in, out. It was like tumbling through a trap door into the present moment, like falling into step with reality instead of always being a few seconds ahead or behind. I brought my, intention, my attention to the place between my shoulder blades that always hurt, it didn't hurt. I practiced pausing my breath. My attention paused with it. It was as if the sun was directly above me so that my attention, which had always shadowed my body at a distance, was suddenly aligned with my physical self. It was like closing out all the extra programs running on the computer so that one, the important one, could work in the way it was supposed to. It felt amazing. So then this transitions out of her blog and it's back into the narrator's voice describing her in the third person. The only time she'd had a similar experience was when she and Lena had taken mushrooms their junior year, although she decided not to include this detail in her blog. They'd walked out into the forest behind campus and the forest was so forest-like, so sublime that Adela lay on the ground and smelled the earth, unresistant to the dampness seeping into her clothing. The feeling of non-resistance that Adela felt that morning in the meditation hall was so powerful, so familiar, that for a moment she feared someone had slipped her some drugs. She sat there breathing in and out until she heard the bell for breakfast, and then she opened her eyes. The Buddha statue sat in front of her, eyes downcast, deathless and beautiful. Stay here, she thought. She could not stop feeling the in and out of her breath. It was there as she bent her body for the bows and as she walked to the door, her feet pressing into the ground. She realized with terror and elation that she could not stop meditating. As this thought arose, she noted thinking, thinking, just as Bonte had instructed her. She tried to let her mind wander and it would not go. She tried thinking of Thiha. Thinking, thinking, responded her mind. She descended the stairs one by one, each footfall a revelation. So this was what it was like to walk. This was what it was like to breathe. All that had been a drab background to her inner dramas moments earlier was rendered in technicolor. The sweeper's rattan basket, abandoned at the dormitory's entrance, cast such exquisite shadows on the dust. The morning air was impossibly cool, and she took little sips of it as if it were a life-giving ambrosia. And it was. She was alive. She was breathing. 
She spent several minutes watching the sun break through a purple cloud on the horizon, its rays like a light show that only she could appreciate. It took Adela a long time to get to breakfast. Da Penchawati was waiting for her, and she spooned food onto Adela's plate reverently, aware that something had changed. Yellow bean curry. Adela raised the spoon to her lips, felt it entering her mouth, noted the expectation of how the food would taste and the actual taste. There was the same sulfurous undertone with a little more lemongrass that morning. Unpleasant, but not extremely so. The difference was the unpleasantness didn't disturb her. It came and it went. It didn't belong to her. She noticed it as indifferently as she noticed the color of the beans or the slant of the light. Then Adela had her second real insight. Being in the present moment, paying attention without resistance, was paradise. How could a simple thing like grasping a water glass be paradise? How could she never have realized it before? Her father's attempt to expunge all Judeo-Christian lore from her mind must have failed because the image that arose was of the Garden of Eden. Adela felt like she had been forgiven. She realized why Da Panchawati called Buddhism her refuge. Adela saw clearly how afraid she had been, how much energy she'd wasted trying to avoid discomfort instead of simply letting it come and go. After breakfast, Adela spent 40 minutes walking to the meditation hall. It didn't matter what she was doing because every action was equally interesting and worthwhile. Sitting, walking, taking a shower, she had no preference. She watched pleasant and unpleasant sensations arise and pass away without clinging to them. She remembered the Taiwanese meditator, how her, even her eyeballs had moved slowly. How long had that woman stayed in this state? No wonder she hadn't been interested in making small talk with Adela, when she could enjoy the bliss of turning a doorknob or lifting, moving, and placing her feet. Suddenly, Adela felt a rush of tenderness for the lady. How hard she must have worked on her meditation. How wonderful it was that she had found such serenity. Adela waited a moment for the familiar stab of jealousy, the feeling of inadequacy that usually followed her recognition of other people's accomplishments. It did not come. Instead, she felt overwhelming love. It was a kind of love she'd never felt before, certainly not for a stranger. Dear, stocky, Taiwanese lady, Adela wished that wherever the woman was, she was well-fed, well-rested, and that she was continuing her meditation practice. I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks <clears throat> thanks for reading that. It's great to to end on the note of coming back to mindfulness and the practice. And as you were reading it, I, I realized also what struck me was the uh, how how you have different layers captured in this book and and just how much I appreciate that. I think that uh, I've been in the, the number of years I've been in Myanmar, the number of different activities I've done, I've worn just so many different hats and one of, and being in different communities and different networks. And obviously it was the meditative network and interest that brought me there. That was the first lens and prism that I, I came to understand Myanmar and then came to wear other glasses. One of the things I would note is that when different people would come according to their profession, if they were diplomat or aid worker or journalist or meditator or uh, English teacher, whatever else, they, and I, this is probably true of anywhere in the world, but I found it particularly true in Myanmar, they would really see everything in the country through those lens and mm -hmm. they were not incorrect. They, they were not uh, even quite misunderstanding things. They were just highlighting and minimizing and looking away from other things that disrupted or distorted or competed with what they wanted to see. And so it would come to be very difficult to talk about the country because if you were talking with a human rights activist, there would be very little interest or appreciation of some of these meditative traditions and what they offered and what their value was. And if you were talking to a meditator who came, there would be kind of a tacit brief acknowledgement of some of the... Um, the the problems in the country, but really to want to 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 push that aside into a a a worldly issue that one need not concern because this was a different practice or that can give nominal uh, interest or attention to, but um, but only up to a point, and that that limited understanding of what 
one's perspective and interests were also limited than the understanding of how this country was operating. And to to only come with one of those lens and to not appreciate some of the others meant that you were always working with an incomplete picture. And you know, it's very interesting because if you have a, a scholar who's there, their their intention of being there is to want to know everything as deeply as they can. And yet there's this religious, meditative, spiritual aspect that they're so uncomfortable it just gets wiped out and their entire analysis is affected by it. And so also with the meditator who is coming to want to 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 investigate ignorance, to shine a light on things that are unknown, and to uh, to be introspective and and uh, and and to gain insights is is yet closed off to so much of the country and the monasteries in the country that make them run. And it, it's just rare to find um, some some person or some. Uh, some material that is able to acknowledge the coexistence of all these different layers without necessarily knowing how to explain them, because I don't know if it's even possible to attempt to to understand them beyond just acknowledging that they are existing simultaneously and they're they're not just existing in their separate planes simultaneously, they're coexisting and co-creating what the country and culture is. And uh, and so that I think this passage, which we haven't really talked about the meditative aspect so much in this conversation and how it relates to our lives personally and how it relates to Myanmar, but I think bringing this in now, this is a really important aspect to tie into the conversation, uh, this, this aspect of these meditative insights that come and to connect them to the Rohingya issue and to Myanmar in the transition period and to the, the Bamar and ethnic relations and to the exoticism and, and Orientalism that is descending. All these things are, are happening simultaneously and coexisting. And I imagine for you as a writer, it was a very conscious, uh, as, as a writer and as a person who had lived and experienced this, this was a very conscious desire to want to create an authentic atmosphere where these things did coexist. Yeah, there's a lot there. And I think, <clears throat> I guess another motivation of writing this book is just to encourage people to like go do a meditation <laughs> retreat. So um, maybe it will inspire some people to do that. But yeah, I see what you're saying. You know, it's like I have friends who do public health in Myanmar and like, see everything through that lens, right? Like it's all about people's health and the nourishment they're getting. And like, how can we ignore that? You know, how can we turn away from that? Or, you know, people who are like, no, no, it's all about elections. And like, if people can't make their voice heard and make choices and they're not going to be able to choose anything. And um, I think, you know, because I am a super fan of this podcast and have listened to a lot of the different episodes and have heard the way different guests have kind of, you know, you have pretty diverse guests coming from many of those different perspectives that you described, like, you know, politics and um, certainly spirituality. But what drew me to this podcast was a post that you wrote about spiritual bypassing, I think not long after the coup. Um, and I think because I kind of went the opposite direction, you know, like I got interested in Myanmar because of its politics and then became interested in Buddhism kind of incidentally along the way. Whereas I think it works the opposite way for a lot of people. Um, I, you know, it kind of hadn't even occurred to me that <laughs> like I, I hadn't known that many people who have meditated in Burma, you know, and that attitude of like, Oh yes. Like it's very sad what's happening here, but like, the important thing is the practice basically. And we should just keep practicing and send metta or whatever, like that attitude was kind of unfamiliar to me. I I'm much more familiar with the attitude of like, Oh my gosh, Burma is everything. Like we have to, you know, that almost like a feeling of self importance that some people out from outside of the country have about like the impact that they feel they can make and that their work can make, you know, who would never do, who, who in contrast, totally don't care about what's happening in monasteries, you know, and don't have an interest in the practice or in Buddhism. And I did want to bring those two things together because I would say definitely the vast majority of my academic Burma friends are not, don't, consider themselves Buddhist, don't practice meditation, and 
the vast majority of my meditation friends, you know, are not particularly interested in Burmese politics. So I think, you know, finding that overlap, um, and, and when I say that, of course, I don't mean people from Myanmar, obviously there's a lot of overlap there, um, in terms of those two categories, but, you know, since this book is centered on foreigners experience of the country, um, that's what I was talking about just then, but yeah, I, I think I did want to bring that together and have, have those t- perspectives coexist in one book. And, you know, it, it would seem so strange to leave out, <clears throat> to have the book take place in a monastery, but to not describe meditation and and to not describe some of the Buddha's teachings. So I definitely wanted to have that in there. Well, thank you for those kind compliments of the podcast. It is a uh, uh, podcast rarely get feedback. People usually listen on their own time. So it's just delightful to, uh, to hear that. And yeah. it's, it's also quite interesting because as a, as a podcast producer and, um, and, and bringing on guests, it's been quite interesting to get the feedback from the different kinds of listeners that await certain kinds of episodes. And, you know, when yeah. we made, um, just to give some background for those that don't know, we were, before the coup, we were really just focused on stories of involving meditation of the spiritual path, which you could definitely do a podcast around. There's just so much dynamicism uh, and interest just about that alone. But after the coup, we opened up to a wider, um, to be able to encompass a wider view beyond just Buddhism and meditation, but to, to tell the stories of, uh, of what Myanmar was going through. And um, when we made that transition, there were some people that would reach out to me and say, I am so glad you finally dropped this. I am so glad that you finally are, are going to these other themes I'm so interested in because I just did not want to hear that religious stuff. And to be clear, we didn't drop the meditation part of it. It's still, there's still yeah. episodes centered just on that. It's just, it's been expanded while there's been other people that have been there from the beginning and they, they've given me feedback. They just kind of tune out when it's not meditation, you know, like when there's this other stuff there, they're just, Oh great. You know, with a monk or a spiritual journey. And yeah. I, I only have to hear a little bit about the the situation in Myanmar. I can really just get into more of their, their spiritual teaching. That's that's what I want to absorb, and uh, and so it's been. Sometimes when I have a, a queue of uh, episodes that are ready to be done, I'm just kind of like, do I release something about R2P or elections mm-hmm. or the Pawuk method or mm-hmm. you know um, <laughs> like l- like ordaining as a monk and, and living for five years or you know it's it's, it's just kind of funny thinking about how that that audience has has expanded, but at the same time, I think what I've tried to do is to to have a not hear their attitude of like this stuff is all happening together and to want to encourage those that are interested and care about Myanmar have experienced there through something other than, than the meditative part and maybe have been dismissive of it that they, they could be interested. They should be interested. It doesn't, whether they take up a practice or not, that, that it's interrelated and as, and same for meditators who are, are listening and see that the world does exist. And this is the world in Myanmar and understanding the dynamics of the country and culture more will probably enhance their practice. I really do believe that because it's, it's grounded, it's contextualized, it's connected. It's not, um, it's not this, this fantasy in the mind of what you want it to be or what you imagine it to be, but it's actually having these connections that only greater knowledge and information can provide. And so, uh, and so just as you have created this book with these different coexisting layers, I think that's something that's been a positive, uh, change that, that has come a transition that I, I hadn't really seen myself doing before, but that also brings out more parts of me where we're, we're able to, go with where the guest is and not have an agenda of, of how we want them to share, but to be able to speak richly from their perspective and experience and understanding and hope that the audience comes along for the ride, you know, hope that, that whatever they came in through the door, whether it was uh, uh, politics or coup or COVID or meditation or whatnot, that they see that this other topic or guest can, even if it's not directly what they're doing, can probably inform them and teach them something more about the the situation that they care about that has been outside their periphery. Um, it also reminds me, I had a, um, we had uh, one guest on who was a American expat living in Myanmar for a couple of years. And he was, um, 
it, he was very involved in in just the expat world of just like the activities and the um, and the social and the networking and, and everything else. And he also was a very serious meditator in the Chamiyeta tradition and um, would go to Chamiyeta Monastery, which was close to his home. And he would not come out about his meditation practice to his foreign expat friends uh, yeah. because the the views on Buddhism and meditation were so negative, partly from the Rohingya crisis, partly from not really being this rational Western thing, partly from the image of a white person in Myanmar doing this thing, mm -hmm. even though he was Hispanic American. Um, but but it was still the the whole optics of that. And he uh um, he kept this part of his life private for the stigma, stigmatization that he feared he would face from the expat community for, for being involved in all of their activities and perspectives and work and everything, but also doing this thing was kind of like going native in a, in a negative light. And, uh, yeah. and so he kept this, he, 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 I mean, he used those words. He didn't come out and admit that he meditated. He described one moment when a friend came to his house and looked at his bookshelf and saw all these books on Buddhism and meditation and it was like this embarrassment of trying to explain why he was reading them. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, so I think that I, I, I hope that in some small way, it's able to um, to take these different worlds and different perspectives and not try to explain them because I have no freaking idea. I, I have, I, I mean, I, I, I acknowledge it. I see it. I have no idea how some of this stuff works and why it does other than it is there and that when it's when one is blind to it, then um, you're missing something when you're, when you're prioritizing something and minimizing something else. But um, how, can we, how can we acknowledge the coexistence and co-creation of these different spheres and layers and bring us a greater understanding of what that means about this place and conflict? And, you know, that, and I actually hadn't thought of this until this moment of the conversation with you. That that is something very similar that you did in the writing in 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 creating this fictional world based on a reality of um, the place and the characters coming together. You you have brought these different layers in an authentic way to to be able to coexist and co create something. Well, that would be a generous description of the mm -hmm. book. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's such an interesting story. I haven't listened to that episode about the person you described, but that's, you know, that's kind of sad to me. Like, um, but, but it also made me think of a recent episode that I loved, um, the interview with Matida, um, mm -hmm. because for her, it's like, there's no separation. It's not like she <laughs> was interested in Burmese politics and then like, got interested in meditation it seems like it's kind of been intertwined from the beginning and it was you know she describes these you know, pursuing meditation even while she was in prison and like just this amazing path that she's on that is one path that's not mm -hmm. a spiritual path and a political path it's mm -hmm. one path and right. you know she's someone who I've had the honor to meet several times and she's just so amazing and so accomplished and it was really cool to hear her describe her her experiences from both of those perspectives and not have it be yeah. divided um in the way that you just described and so i think another thing i love about this podcast is that it's you know there's a balance of like people from the country and from outside of the country and um i think that also brings something important to it yeah and i think with mathida uh, what, what's also interesting is that when you have a story like hers, I think, and she is someone who who has uh, some attention and is well known in Burmese circles and by foreign academics and, and is highly regarded. And I think when her story is understood from their perspective, as mentioned before, the meditation part is minimized and there's not a lot of curiosity about that. It's really the story of a, a political prisoner, of someone who has persevered, of someone who believes in her values. And meditation is just kind of like, well, if you're a Buddhist, you do meditation, or if you're a Christian, or if you're an artist, or, you know, it's just kind of what you fall back on to survive. And even when Mathida and people like her are interviewed on other forums or when their story is told, there is never that I have seen curiosity in the meditation they do. There, there is 
never questions about, right. you know, what insights they had, what practices they did, what challenges were there, and just on and on and on. The things, the, the, the more nerdy technical questions I want to get into, yeah. um, but really just like Buddhist meditation. It's a monolithic thing that, you know, anyone mm-hmm. in prison can do and, and, and they just do it and they're okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because there's no interest or curiosity and perhaps some discomfort. So also from the meditative perspective, it's, it's like, oh, meditation is, this is, this is a story about the triumph of meditation and that, you know, right. Dhamma will always prevail and Dhamma always wins. It always works. And whatever <laughs> circumstances you find yourself in, you, you just pull up these techniques and you can, you can use these to, uh, seek liberation in any time and place and confront any obstacles. And again, there's this kind of lack of curiosity or interest and maybe even a discomfort in why was she in prison? Like what, mm-hmm. what was right. she actually doing? What was she striving for? What was she working to try to create? And so I, I also don't want to have an interview where all we do is, is just kind of have these self-affirming, um, uh, the self-affirming narrative where we're just like, yeah, is it meditation great? Like, oh, wow, yeah, you know, you, you did this and you survived in this way. And, you know, we just all feel good about ourselves and our practice. But, you know, to, to be, and Mathita is one of several others I put up there is just a great example of people that are co-inhabiting co-in- both of these worlds and not even like stepping in one world and out the other, but really like these are, and this is uh, true of Myanmar society, these, these are overlapping, intersecting. I don't know where one begins and one ends and I think to understand her story is to to approach it in that way because if you only ask questions about one or the other she's only going to ask if you only want to know about her meditation experience now great meditation is that's probably what you'll get um, and it's true it's nothing that you're creating or fabricating if you only want to talk about her her writing um, uh, 88 um, the political process Aung San Suu Kyi that's the only thing you'll get you're not fabricating anything that's true that's all there but if you don't have an interest you are guilty of uh, highlighting something and minimizing something else, which leads to a, a a lack of a proper understanding as to who this person really is and where they operate. And so I, I think, uh, um, yeah, I think that's my long-winded way of saying how to, how to put these two worlds together. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that's just the central tension, right? It's like, you know, we have to have, that balance of compassion and equanimity that's so hard, you know, it's like, how can you keep feeling, how can you keep being open to feeling empathy for people when their suffering is so great, Mm -hmm. but also how can you not just be like Adela and be like, okay, I'll fix it, (laughs) you know, but to Mm -hmm. have, Mm -hmm. you know, just this honesty of like, yeah, what I do actually might not make that much of a difference, but I'm still going to do it. Um, because if it has any chance of reducing suffering, either mine or someone else's, it's worth doing. Um, I think that kind of humility is, um, is something it can take a long time to get to. And certainly that I'm still working on. Yeah. And also sitting in discomfort, you know, sitting in that discomfort of, and that, that discomfort can take on many forms according to who the person is. It could mean a discomfort in, in realizing the value that some people, if not oneself place on the meditative and spiritual path and, and that that is important to them and being open to learning why it is and how it manifests uh, without judgment. Uh, for those that are clearly on the spiritual path and coming from a Western background, that discomfort can mean that really, really bad and ugly things are now happening in Myanmar. And let's be honest, they've been happening for a long, long time. And they've right. been happening to places and people that most of us meditators are involved with. And mm-hmm. being um, being able to bear witness and open to uh, a sense of spaciousness that that is acknowledging this happens without necessarily trying to fix it, but realizing this is in the same world as the practice that I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, well, great. This has just been a great conversation uh, about uh, looking at some of the background that went into your book and, and writing and then extrapolating beyond that. I've I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much.
we'd like to take this time to thank our generous supporters who have already given. We simply cannot continue to provide you with this content and information without the wonderful support of generous listeners, donors, and friends like you. Each episode helps in providing access to one more voice, one more perspective, one more insight. Every donation of any size is greatly appreciated and it helps us to continue this mission. We greatly appreciate your generosity, which allows us to maintain this platform and everything else we do. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go to support a wide range of humanitarian missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person, IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the Purchasing of Protective Equipment and Medical Supplies, COVID Relief, and much more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution for a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian aid work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A.org and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit cards. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either the Insight Myanmar or Better Burma websites for specific links to those respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. If you'd like to give in another way, please contact us. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support.